invited to join us as we take a glimpse at the life of right, excellent Marcus Messiah Garvey, Jamaica's first national hero. Most of our reflections will take place in the St. Anne's Bay Methodist Church, which he attended as a child. The witness of the church started 200 years ago with 20 members and two freed slaves, Prince Trusty and his wife, as the two class leaders. It is recorded that Trusty's comprehension of what the preacher said and his own interpretation of the scriptures were remarkable. The church was therefore built on strong spiritual ground and this would have had an influence on Garvey. We have proof of the strength of this building as it has been extensively damaged on four occasions. In 2018, the church was destroyed by fire and only the four strong walls and firm foundation remain as part of the building which is being restored. There are enough teachings and speeches made by Garvey which could positively impact the nation, especially in these trying times. This is but a glimpse at the life and teachings of Marcus Garvey. Let us begin by inviting Bishop Christine Gooden Ben Gushi, head of the Jamaica Methodist District, to thank God for sending him among us and for the relevance of his teachings and philosophy even now. We pause to meditate upon the mission and vision of others who through their willingness and selfless acts of love for humanity, nation and the world, gave and gave and gave again completely of themselves, not counting the cost. Today we pause in prayer as we celebrate the life and memory of the right excellent Marcos Mosiah Garvey, national hero and son of the soil of our island home, Jamaica. Let us pray. Gracious God and our Heavenly Father, for all remembrances of his life, we praise you. Today we give you thanks for one whose memory gives us the golden light of day. One whose memory is something to cherish as we recall him to mind. Thank you for choosing him to be the torch bearer, trail blazer, and visionary who dared to dream and make it a reality. Thank you for the courage that enabled and empowered him to struggle and toil in spite of the odds. He was way ahead of his generation by far. He stumbled many times, dear Lord, but kept the flame ignited. For his life, we give you thanks, O God. Thank you for continuing to hold in your care all who journeyed ahead of us, the criticisms, moments of weakness, the obstacles that were in his path, yet he kept on plodding with a zeal powered by a heart and a mind that were intent on fulfilling his mission. He was guided by a sense of purpose and a mission mandate to fulfill under God the task entrusted to him for generations yet unborn. He gave a constant reminder that God made us masters of our own destiny. As he now rests in sleep, we commemorate his life with celebration and great joy and pray that those who come behind will seek to honor his memory and through his life of service be motivated to serve. Hear us now, we humbly beseech you, for Christ's sake and glory. Amen and Amen. When I am down 
And know my soul so weary When troubles come And my heart burdened be Then I am still And wait here in the silence Until you come And sit a while with me You raise me up So I can stand on mountains You raise me up To walk on stormy seas I am strong When I am on your shoulders You raise me more than I can be. There is no life, no life without its hunger. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. But when you Sometimes I think I glimpse eternity. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on. Marcus Garvey as a child. Marcus Mazagar was born here at 32 Market Street, St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica, on August 17, 1887. He was the son of Marcus Garvey Sr. and Sarah Jane Richards. Garvey said his father was a man of brilliant, intel, and dashing courage. He once had a fortune, but he died poor. His mother was a sober and a conscientious Christian. Part of his childhood days were spent at Winders Hill in St. Anne's Bay. He attended the St. Anne's Bay Primary School when it was located at the St. Anne's Bay Baptist Church. He said he grew up with other black and white boys and girls and was unaware that there were any difference between black and white as he had never heard the word Negro. He and one of his white playmates, girls, parted when he was about 14 and her parents sent her away and told her she should never write or get in touch with him because he was a nigger. When he grew up, the black and white boys separated and took different courses in life. He grew up to see this difference in race more and more. His schoolmates as young men did not know him anymore. 
His godfather, Alfred Burroughs, a highly educated man, operated a printer and taught him many things before he was 12 years old. He became a printer's apprentice and at age 14, he had enough experience and intelligence to manage men and make them respect him. unpleasant childhood racial experience influenced his adult life. He started to record his thoughts, hopes, and teachings. Listen to some of what he said in I, Marcus Garvey. What I write today may live with me, but when I die, my writing lives on. Therefore, what do you or write must be so clear as to live on when you are gone that others read it and might get a clear conception of what you mean. I started to take an interest in the politics of my country and then I saw the injustice done to my race because it was black and I became dissatisfied on that account. I went traveling to South and Central America and parts of the West Indies to find out if it was so elsewhere and I found the same situation. I set sail for Europe to find out, and again I found the stumbling block. I ask, where is the black man's government? Where is his king and his kingdom? Where is his president, his country, and his ambassador, his army, his navy, his men of big affairs? I could not find them, and then I declared, I will help to make them. I was determined that the black man would not continue to be kicked about by all the other races and the nations of the world. My young and ambitious mind led me into flights of great imagination. I saw before me then a new world of black men, not peons, serf, dogs, and slaves, but a nation of sturdy men making their impress upon civilization and causing a new light to dawn upon the human race. My brain was afire. There was a world of thought to conquer. I had to start here. It became too late and the work to be done. Sentence, sentence, me. Hey, Marcus Yavi. Sentence, 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 me. To fulfill the prophecy. Sentence, 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 me. Hey, Marcus Yavi. No history. This is a young I black story. I want you to talk, talk, black Marcus. Bad a block stick, mm-hmm. and I should be now your years again. No bad a block stick, uh-uh. and I should be now your years again. Don't do that, my friend. 
down by the block stick mm-hmm. And I should be now your years again Go by the block stick And I should be now your years Marcus Garvey, the spiritual man. Emphasis has been laid on Garvey's leadership skills and philosophy, but little has been said about his spirituality. Yet in almost every speech, reference is made to God and something spiritual. Listen to some of his statements. Our cause is based upon righteousness. God Almighty is our leader and Jesus Christ, our standard bearer. God made us all to dwell on the face of the earth, and we are all children of one common Father. You have the wrong idea if you think that it is God's duty to find a job for you, to give you a chance and opportunity to get the best out of the world. His duty and obligation is to give you spiritual strength and grace. If you want a job, go hunt for it. If you want a good home like that of your neighbors, work for yours. Do not expect that God, by your prayer, is going to take the neighbor's house and give to you. God is not white, nor is he black. God is a spirit and the universal intelligence of which earth and everything is a part. The church is the most beneficent institution, the greatest civilizing agency, the institution which is the begetter and ward of the rights and privileges, the freedom and liberty, not only of the community, but of the individual. It is the power protective of life and property. It is positive in its effect and of a potency unequaled by any other service of which our civilization boasts. Read a chapter of the Bible every day. The greatest wisdom of the age is to be found in the scripture. Marcus Garvey, the politician. Marcus Garvey formed the first political party in Jamaica when he founded the People's Political Party in 1929. Some of the items in the manifesto of this visionary man were remarkable and have been implemented. They include the following. Self-government for Jamaica. Minimum wage for the working class. Insurance for working class for accident, sickness and death. An eight hour working day throughout the island. A law to impeach and imprison judges who with disregard for British justice and constitutional rights deal unfairly. A Jamaican university and polytechnic a government high school in each parish supplying free education. A public library in the capital of each parish. The appointment of court stenographers in each parish. The creation of a legal aid clinic. The establishment of health centers. The beautifying and creation of the Kinston Racecourse into a national park similar to Hyde Park in London. A few items in the manifesto are still outstanding and include prison and land reform. Instead of being praised for this remarkable vision, Garvey was punished for proposing that judges should be imprisoned or impeached if they deal with citizens unfairly. He was arrested, made to pay a fine of £100 and served three months in a district prison at Spanish Town. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, 
Marcus Garvey studied in England, which exposed him to the law and philosophy. He had traveled to many countries and had seen how black people were downtrodden, disrespect, and disadvantaged. When he returned to Jamaica, he founded the Universal Improvement Association, the UNIA, in 1914 for the purpose of helping to raise black people of his race to the highest state of appreciation among the race of the world. Marcus Garvey was one of the greatest mass leaders as at one time. The UNIA had over 11 million members. The motto of the UNIA was one aim, one God, one destiny. Garvey electrified speech, his ability to make black people not to be ashamed of their color, and his vision have had a lasting impact to expose to his teaching. Several world leaders had admitted that Garveyism had played an influence on them. The aims of the UNIA. Many of the aims of the UNIA are still relevant today and include striving like the other race of the world for freedom and manhood, standing for the highest in racial idea, yielding to all race, the right to ascend to the loftiest peak of human progress, working for the economy, industrial, commercial, social, political liberation of black people of the world, unifying black people to recognize the brotherhood of man and to desire them to clap hands with all men of every race, nation, and tribe. Garvey said about UNIA, I have founded, I have set everything aside to do this work. It is part of me. I dream about it. I sacrifice, I suffered for it, I live for it, and I would gladly die for it. You are encouraged to visit Liberty Hall, 78 King Street, Kingston, to learn more about the life teaching, vision, philosophy of Marcus Garvey. Let us hear from Colleen Whittingham, president of the St. Anne's Bay Primary School Past Students Association, whose encouragement and securing of funds has enabled us to undertake this project. As a child who was born in St. Anne's Bay, I heard a lot about Marcus Garvey. During my childhood years, I developed a keen interest in the life and times of this native son. Many aspects of his life were somewhat similar to mine, in that he started at the St. Anne's Bay Methodist Church, where I too started my Christian journey. We both attended the St. Anne's Bay Primary School, although he went during a time when a number of my older relatives were students there. Marcus spent some of his childhood years living on Windows Hill. I too lived on Windows Hill as a child. Growing up on Windows Hill, I was fortunate to get some first-hand information of this famous hero who once lived next door. Windows Hill children main stomping ground was on the closest property that is owned by the Methodist Church. One of the things I remember most, gigantic mango tree that was known to have been planted by Marcus Garvey as a boy on cloisters. No one was able to climb it by the trunk. They had to do so by the branches. Not only that, the mangoes had a unique taste. They were some of the most delicious mangoes that I have ever eaten. This gave Windersill children bragging rights in saying we have truly eaten the fruit of Marcus's labor. After leaving school, on my first job interview, the interviewer's curiosity was triggered when he realized that I am from where Marcus was born. 
he was a staunch supporter of Garvey. It was at his invitation that I became a member of the UNIA. I continued this for some time until I realized that no other young people were participating. However, I maintain my interest by reading extensively on anything that is Garvey related. Since the inception of St. Asbury Primary School Past Students Association, we remain steadfast in honoring the life of this philosopher and St. Anne's Bay Primary School most famous past student through forums, his birthday on National Era's Day and during Black History Month in the U.S. Not knowing the right Honorable Marcus Garvey personally, I can truly say that he has notably enrich our knowledge in preparing us for this 21st century. Garvey the Orator When Garvey lived in London, he used to lead debates at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, a famous spot for public debates. Some of Garvey's sayings are often quoted, such as one which said, We are going to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery, because whilst others might free the body, none but ourselves can free the mind. He was very interested in education, as can be seen in the quotation at the entrance of the Marcus Garvey Technical High School in St. Anne's Bay. No glimpse at his life would be complete without hearing him deliver one of his memorable speeches. Listen now for one captioned know yourself God's great big family. may i say something to you to give you a true knowledge of yourself and life so that the same glory and success attained by other men who understand themselves may be yours man in the full knowledge of himself is a superb and supreme creature of creation 
When man becomes possessor of the knowledge of himself, he becomes master of his environment, the captain of his own ship, the director of his own destiny, the accomplisher of his own ends. Man should understand himself because man is full of knowledge and this knowledge is a gift of nature. When Mother Nature created man, she deprived him of nothing. He was given the faculty of understanding all things around him. And this faculty for understanding has not been taken away from him. None of his senses have been taken away from him. So there is no excuse for the black man in lacking the knowledge that man is used to beautify the world and produce all that he needs for his happiness and civilization. Look the world over and whatever you see in it that is pleasing to man, contributing to man's comfort, to his needs and to his satisfaction, it is but the work of man. Man blessed with the knowledge of himself and the understanding of all things around him. If you are able to live with the knowledge of yourself and with the greater knowledge of nature, you must know what is good and what is not. You must know what is finite. You must know that which is material, physical and otherwise is at your disposal to create or otherwise use. If we leave America and go over to the east to Japan, they will be telling their fellow citizens of Japan of the wonderful accomplishments of the Japanese people, proving that man is moving onward as time moves on. But you, you have hated yourselves as you have done in previous years. You have shown malice, prejudice and hate to each other. And the result is that while other races have made progress, while India has made progress towards nationalism, while Ireland has made progress towards republicanism, while the whole world has made progress in man's accomplishments, you still stand fighting yourselves, dishonoring yourselves, showing no disposition toward that higher life so that you will be abundantly blessed. So reflect and think that you were created for some purpose other than exhibiting malice toward your neighbor or fellow men of your own race. What a pity it is that we cannot stand united without a written law. There is no written law compelling other races to stand together. They are brought together by the gentle touch of nature. The unwritten law of nature causes them to stand together on all occasions. So wheresoever you find them in the field, that one gentle touch of nature causes them to stand together, if need be, die together. But with a black man, you can preach to him from the pulpits. You lecture from the platforms, from the byways and the hedges. The spirit of cooperation, but he will not cooperate. You talk to him gently, you try talking harshly to him, he still will not cooperate. The result is that he falls prey to those who understand themselves and walk through the world making you their serfs and slaves. You must acquire an understanding of yourselves. Look around you. See the smiling pictures of nature, the beautiful hedges, the wonderful mountains, the wonderful vegetation all around. But because of your disposition to each other, you live in suffering, in want, in penury and in debt. You lack the gentle touch of nature, love for each other, you hate yourselves. Black men and black men, and what is wrong with you? Why have you no affection for yourselves? Could I hope to see you living among yourselves as the people I've spoken of? Living in charity, love, and in sympathy with each other? It can be done. I wonder if you will adapt that course. Isn't it easier to enjoy prosperity than to live in ignorance and darkness? Why select the worst out of nature? Nature never gave pain, suffering, and death to the world. It was man himself who selected death, pain, and sorrow. I wonder if I cannot inspire you to select between good and evil. Let me impress upon you once again that whatsoever your hardships may be, whatsoever your difficulties in life, they are your own selection. And so if you encourage them, if you husband them and take them to your bosom, they will abide with you. Nature will not take them away from you as Mother Nature did not give them to you. She is not responsible for your sorrows. Mother Nature represents all that is beautiful. She gave you the highest personality in the realm divine. Your sorrows are your own. If you want joy, if you want sunshine, it is before you abundantly in nature. I made a selection of sunshine, the beautiful sunshine. I made a selection to laugh with the moon, to laugh with the stars, and sing with the birds of the forest and of the wilderness, to join in the rhythmic music of the winds that sing from east to west and from north to south. Had I selected sorrow, I would have been dead a long time ago and been without that which would send me into the presence of the divine, because I would have lived not with the knowledge that is divine. We must acquire the higher knowledge of life. Black men and black women, will you get the knowledge that the white man has that causes him to be leaders and masters in the world? They are not gods with a peculiar source for understanding the world around them. They have only given expression to the knowledge of their humanity and been able to use and conquer all to their satisfaction and glory. And that is why they are always greater than you in every community that you find them. Isn't it strange that wheresoever the white man is found, he takes precedence over you? Why is that so? Answer that for yourselves, black men and black women. 
wheresoever you come in contact with the white man, you always have to go down in defeat before him. Whether it be in England, in France, or in America, you always have to go down to the white man, and yet he has two eyes, two feet, two hands, same passions, same senses and feelings as you have. Your feet are not put on opposite sides, now your hands turned around the other way. But it's because you fail to use your will, your knowledge, and your mental faculties to the point where you will enjoy life around you. I'm only here and not in the gutters and in the pond of despair because I use my intelligence. And I swear that no man alive shall ever use his intelligence in understanding the works of nature more than I. I shall rise as high as he ascends. I shall meet him on the same platform of mental equality and fight him till thy kingdom come because nature created us equal. I want you to make up your mind as I've made up my mind years ago. Make up your mind that you will rise to the knowledge of your soul. Because of your ignorance, you cannot understand and decide between good and evil. You don't know whether you're doing right or wrong. With a greater knowledge of life, you're able to appreciate all things around you. I'm able to gather you here because I understand you. Understand your neighbor, your wife, your children. And you will be able to live in harmony with each other and get the best out of life. A great man leaves us. Marcus Garvey died in England on June 10th, 1940, and was buried at St. Mary's Roman Catholic Cemetery in Kensal Green, London. In 1964, the government of Jamaica arranged for his body to be returned home. It was reinterred in the National Heroes Park, Kingston. When the National Honours and Awards system was developed, right excellent Marcus Mosiah Garvey was named the first national hero in 1969. This statue, sculptured by Alvin Marriott, is located in front of the St. Anne Parish Library and was unveiled on October 17, 1976. In 2012, the St. Anne's Bay Improvement Committee recommended to the St. Anne Parish Council that his birthday be declared Marcus Garvey Day annually. This proclamation was signed by His Excellency, the Governor General, Sir Patrick Allen, on August 13, 2012. are invited to visit this Marcus Garvey reading room located at the St. Anne Parish Library to learn more about this inspirational leader. Garvey cannot return physically to remind us of what he said. Up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. But has his spirit seen our trials, tribulations, financial woes, medical challenges, social conflicts, and other problems? Is he inspiring us to revisit his visions? teachings and philosophy so that we can fulfill our role as a little but taller nation in the world. Think on these things while the journey continues. Storm cloud at night so 
suddenly gathers All armies come rushing to thee We must in the fight be victorious When swords are thrust outward to gleam For us will the victory be glorious When led by the red, black and green Advance, advance to victory Let Africa be free Advance to meet the foe Advance to meet the foe With the might of the red The black and the green With the might Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hand By thee shall all fetters be broken And heaven bless our dear motherland Advance, advance to victory Let Africa be free Advance to meet the foe Advance to meet the foe Ooh. Mm-hmm.